Hey, welcome into the program. Joel Klatt here. This is the Joel Klatt Show, and I can't wait for this edition. I'm going to get right into it without all the, you know, hey, you guys know, follow, subscribe, do all that stuff, social media. But we got Peter Schrager here. This is one, first of all, one of my best friends on the planet. Second of all, one of, if not the most connected guy in the NFL. And on draft week, this is an event that I know he loves, I love. And so we had to get together and discuss this thing. So, Shregs, what's up, buddy? How, how are I, you? I love being on this show with you. You're doing so great with it. It's all over my Twitter feed, all the different things you do. And it's it's been great. But, Joel, for the listeners, we go back to, like, getting to really know each other at the 2013 and 2014 senior bowls. Yeah. You and I would go to mobile for Fox sports one, and we would do reports on there's this defensive tackle at a pit named Aaron Donald, who is really <laughs> looking good here in mobile goes on to be the best defensive tackle of all time. But Joel, you know, I respect nobody more when it comes to the college game and I love your draft stuff too. So this is cool for me. Yeah, this is, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be really fun because this is really kind of, latest and greatest as it relates to news in the the draft process so that everyone knows it goes really slow for a long time and then all of a sudden late in the process it's a flurry of information you know it's it's a little bit like like a um I don't know, maybe an 800 meter race in, in track and field, right? You got the like the pace laps, and then all of a sudden on that bell lap. Well, we're on the bell lap here for the NFL draft. This is the last few days, and we're just starting to, you know, before the weekend, Peter, and and now into this week, it's starting to get going. That train is is starting to leave the station as far as all the information that's getting out there, um, all the news. Let me start with the big one because you yeah. you haven't been necessarily at the center of it, but. You had the the S two cognitive test guy on your podcast, and and now the S two is all anyone is talking about because of CJ Stroud. Not even not even Bryce Young and his amazing score. It's always about the low score, and so Stroud scores an eighteen on the S two. For those for my listeners, will you explain the S two and why these guys hold it in such high esteem? Sure thing, Joel. You know, for years the Wonderlick test was the gold standard as far as testing a person's intelligence and their ability uh, to use things above the neck. That's the term that they use in the NFL at, at the next level. And the wonder look test historically is train A leaves a station at three o'clock. Train B leaves a station at 320. If train A goes 90 minutes and takes two laps, and train, it's an IQ test and it's a four minute test. It's in and out and it's a score from one to 40. And historically, you know, guys like Ryan Fitzpatrick, who went to Harvard, gets a 40. And there are other quarterbacks who have, you know, great uh, cerebral qualities who get a 40 in the high scores. And then you grade it from one to 40, you go from there. Somewhere along the way, uh, these folks, Brendan Ally is his name. I mean, they're based out of Nashville. They're a company called S2 Cognition. They decided that that's not the best test for what's applicable to the next level when it comes to sports. So it really was baseball to start, but then it moved to football. And it's something called a processing test as opposed to an intelligence test or an IQ test. And what it is is 45 minutes in a uh, virtual reality setting. And it's almost how quick can you process images that are being flashed in your head and be able to process and anticipate what's coming next and what order those images are, what image is next. So say you've got nine images coming at you and they say, what was image three, five, seven? You could be able to spot that out in instantaneous second, like boom, 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 45 minute test. And it's from one to a hundred. And they really started picking up prominence in 2020 during the COVID year and then 2021 and 2022. And this is when it's kind of really made its big break because of the C.J. Stroud story, which was leaked, and Bob McKinn uh, got the scores. I don't know the scores. I don't have that information. But if that got from a, a team to to Bob and that, you know, he got a low score, that's fine. Also, though, that Bryce Young had a high score. I will tell you this. I spoke to a team yesterday about it. I said, gosh, Bryce Young has the highest score ever. No, slow down here. The kid from Stanford scored just as high, if not higher, on the S2 cognition test. We just don't talk about it. And that's Tanner McKee, who's the quarterback out of Stanford. So it's not like Bryce Young's the only guy that had such a high score. And it's not like Bryce, uh, CJ Stroud definitely had as low a score as they said. But it's got a different type of qualities that they're grading. It's how fast can you process information? It's not just an IQ test. So here's, here's an interesting thing. And this is not a pushback on you. Let me just push back against all of it, right? Yep. Okay. Please. So it's it's being hailed as this test that might not 
predict top end success, right? You're hearing that a, a great score doesn't mean you're going to be a great player, but and then there's this there's this caveat, but we've never had a player score really low and go on and be a quality player. And so there's there's this narrative at least uh, that there's no way you can overcome it. Now here's here's the problem that I have with it is that the test is asking me to essentially not believe my own eyes. And it's it's asking me to turn on tape of a guy like Will Levis or and CJ Stroud back to back and and see Levis really struggle processing information in real time on the film on the film struggle understanding what type of trajectory to use uh, throwing the ball to the wrong spots based on coverage turning the ball over because of those decisions and then turn on the CJ Stroud film and and watch him time and time again put the ball in the exact correct spot based on the coverage Use the tra- correct trajectory. Change arm angles against Georgia. Manipulate the pocket. Process information quicker. And yet the, the test is asking me to say like, well, Levis processes information better than Stroud. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm sorry. My eyes are not lying to me. So the question then becomes, how important is the test to the decision makers in the NFL? And is this going to cause Stroud to fall? It's the total package, as you know. It's the same thing as, well, he had you know this injury his sophomore season and it checks out now, but that's something we put on the con list that we you know, have the pro and con list. It's a thing. It's a factor. The NFL teams want as much information as they can get. This is another aspect that they can use. It's a way to justify their pick. It's a way uh, to furthermore question internally whether we're sure we want to make this check trip. But no one's drafting a quarterback based on his S2 cognition score. You base it on the film, you base it on the interviews, you base it on the workouts, and then this is another piece to the to the puzzle. That said, it's a private company. These guys are, are not running a nonprofit. They're not looking to <laughs> like this is a business. Yeah, and of course. you know, these numbers are out there and whether or not you believe it or not is is or you take a lot of validity, it's not as fine. But I'll tell you half the NFL teams do pay for the S2 cognition test to be done and they use those results and it's part of their draft process. But Joel Absolutely. You've seen CJ Stroud play in how many college games? I just yeah. your thoughts on CJ Stroud's intelligence and ability to make a good decision more than some test that he took on a random day that was 45 minutes of his life. It's 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 so fascinating. Uh, just the whole process, right? Because certain things can get blown out of proportion and we talk about it maybe more than the de- decision makers talk about it. I I, I don't know. Um Let's play a little a, a little bit of a game, and I'm going to throw out some names, and I'm going to let's let's call it um, floor ceiling or high low, okay? okay? All right. And yeah. based on what you're hearing, because again, listen, Peter Schrager's my guest. No one's more plugged in than Peter. He, y- you have absolutely killed it over the last few years, ever since we met, and as respected as any man in the NFL. And so I trust you when I start you. asking things like, okay. Where's this guy's ceiling? Where's his floor in the draft? Okay, what, you know how how high could he potentially go? How low could he potentially slide? I think we all kind of know what's going on with Bryce Young. So I'm going to start with the guy we were just talking about, C.J. Stroud. Where do you think his high is uh, on Thursday night? And where's the floor? Where could we see him slide? The interesting thing with this draft is that two, three, and four are really unique, and that two is a complete mystery, and that. By on paper, you'd say Houston should just go quarterback. It makes no sense that they wouldn't. They're going through year three of Davis Mills when you've got every quarterback other than Young on the board, and yet they might not go quarterback. So that's a little bit of a wild card. Three is a team that wants to trade back. So now you're putting that into the mix where a team can trade up and throw this whole thing into flux. It's also a first-year GM and a first-year head coach. And four is a team that we know needs a quarterback, but doesn't necessarily have to go chalk because they've had their opportunity to get their hands and mitts on all these guys and have been thinking about it for 12 months. So I find it to be a really interesting draft. So CJ Stroud, he can go two to Houston and then I'll come on Friday morning and say, you know what? There's a lot of smoke about them not going CJ Stroud. Kudos to Nick Casario and those guys for keeping it close to the vest. They probably wanted to see what kind of offers they would get to move up to two. But at the end of the day, CJ Stroud's their quarterback. He could also slip a little bit because a team might move up to three because they love Richardson and they want the upside on Richardson Four, the Colts might've fell in love with Will Levis, which 
I have heard. I have heard that the Colts. I've also heard that the people in the building who really like Anthony Richardson in Indianapolis. But I think both of those players, you have to keep in the back of the head. They probably didn't expect CJ Stroud to be there at four. So you start convincing yourselves on these other guys and say, well, yeah, well, look, if we're sitting there pretty and we get Levis or Richardson, we're good. Um, I would say I'd be shocked if CJ Stroud was still on the board after eight picks. Let's say Atlanta is their basement. So yeah. two to eight for CJ Stroud. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say seven. You know, I don't know if Vegas would, would let him get out of there. Um, but I, th- that's what's so fascinating. All right. You the, touched- the wild card team there is Tennessee with, yeah. you know, needing a quarterback at some point and Mike Vrabel, very strong Ohio State ties. And you tell me, does Ryan Day speak positively about CJ Stroud? Because yeah. he's been not critical, but he's honest when these teams call him. He's very honest. He was honest um, when when they called about Dwayne Haskins. He was honest when they called about uh, Justin Fields. I will say, and this is not an, an, absolutely not a knock against the other guys. He has been um, higher on Stroud than the other two. So um, that's why I find it interesting what's what's gone on. And maybe Houston is just playing this close to the vest, and and maybe they're trying to get people interested in saying like man maybe houston's not in love maybe we can get stroud you know maybe mm-hmm. this is just a ploy for value a uh, trade proposition i who knows uh but ryan day has has spoken very highly of stroud you're right peter i've covered him more than any college analyst in the game more than any of these draft analysts have been around him i've been around him um i've covered him eight times i saw him make wow. uh, his first start in college i saw him in his third spring practice as a starter um, so I've seen the entire maturation, and, and I can tell you I would be very comfortable taking C.J. Stroud. He's overcome a lot in his life uh, from his upbringing and, and quite frankly, played his best football right at the end when his yeah. best was needed against Georgia. Okay, um, here's another guy that I think is interesting. Give me a, a high-low for Jalen Carter. There's a lot of talk about Jalen Carter in this draft. Really high ceiling on the field. I'm agreeing with that. I, like, great player. When he wants to go, shows up overweight, out of shape to his pro day. Not the most glowing review from folks around Georgia and even around the SEC. So give me a a high low for Jalen Carter. High for Jalen Carter, I would say five. Five to Seattle. Makes sense. And the reason I say Seattle is they might be in the quarterback game, but they didn't expect or think that. So Wilson, they'd get the fifth overall pick. It's almost a gift in their in their lap. They also have the 20th pick. If they want to take a big swing at five, they can. And it's not like they wasted an entire first round. They can get another good player at 20. If they hit at five and they hit at 20, that is setting them up for a long time. And the way their defense looks, and Clint Hurt is the defensive line coach, they are lo- loaded at every position. They did great in the draft last year. You put Jalen Carter inside there, and it is it is a wrecking ball in a wide open NFC and an NFC West that could be theirs. That's five. Six is Detroit. Very similar situation. Just added Aiden Hutchinson on one side. Have the 18th pick also. So you're looking for a team that A, isn't going to remove him from their board altogether, and B, you're looking for a team that if it's a huge swing and a miss and it's a headache, it's not a total wash. They have a backstop at 18 or 20 overall where they can still get another player that's going to be a contributor and is going to make a difference. And then 10 is what I naturally would say for Jalen Carter as the end spot because his agent, Drew Rosenhaus, who's been around this game for 30 years, has openly said that he will not interview with teams outside the top 10. And yeah. one of those reasons is he doesn't want to relive that that horrible, tragic incident time and time again for teams that are not going to be able to pick him. And two, he must have some sort of assurance that he will not escape the top 10. Drew's been doing this for too long, and I have too much respect for Drew Rosenhaus for me to think that he's just putting that out there. Then Jalen Carter goes 17th overall. Yeah, so in my first mock, I thought, I believed it. I was like, you know what, I've heard the things. I've, I've, I've watched you know, the tape. I've done all this. And I'm like, I think he could slide. You know, that, that pro day workout was alarming. Let's be honest. That, that was sure, alarming. It's all alarming. Sure. Some teams don't have him on their board. Those sure. same teams are not in the top 10. That's it's exactly right. And, and your last point about Rosenhaus, I'm like, hold on. This is not some rookie agent who's just, you know, trying to throw out uh, – he knows what's going on. You know, that that the five six makes way too much sense. I hadn't even thought about it from a, a, a risk reward profile, like you put it, in terms of, hey, we can take a big swing if we're Seattle or Detroit, knowing we're backstopped in the first round. 
And Detroit, by the way, they're backstopped also in the second round. They've got four picks in the top 55, you know? So, you know, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And then I go to a guy like Pete Carroll, who I would think has a lot of belief in his himself and his own culture, you know, to take a guy like Jalen and, and fold him into the culture in Seattle. Um, so that's why I ended up going with him at, at five in my latest uh, shregs. But I think the Lions would make a lot of sense as well. Okay, high-low on, on our next guy. And here's a guy that I'm really high on. Covered yeah. him a oh. lot. Covered him a lot. Bijan Robinson. I think he's... I claim him to be the best offensive player that's not a quarterback in the draft. Now, because of the position, he's not going to get taken in the top five. At least I don't, I don't believe. Probably not. Where, where's his high? Where's his low? All right. His high is three. And let Ooh. me make the argument. Wait, let me make really? the argument on three. Yeah. That offense is barren in Arizona. If they keep the pick, it's Kyler. And just a bunch of guys, yeah. especially if they get rid of DeAndre Hopkins. And if you're looking at the blue chip prospects of this draft, there's three names that keep coming up. It's Bryce Young. It's B. John Robinson. And all respect to Tyree Wilson and Will Anderson. It's Jalen Carter. Those are the three names I've been hearing all the time. So three is like, it's a swing and a prayer. It's a one to a hundred shot. But if you're Monty Austin for it and you come in, you're like, I just want players. I want guys who can make plays. Let's give Kyler the best player on offense outside a quarterback. It's B. John Robinson. The end of this thing, it could be 25 or 26 Giants or Cowboys based wow. on the value of the running back. Wow, think about that away. spread. Shregs, think about three to 26. That's Philosophy. wild. What do you make of a team that had uh, you know Isaiah Pacheco and Jarek McKinnon toting the rock throughout the playoffs and won a Super Bowl? Jarek McKinnon, a one year and right now currently unsigned free agent, and Isaiah Pacheco, the 17th running back taken in the draft, was getting major carries in the fourth quarter. The running back position just is not valued like it used to be. So a lot of people think I wouldn't take him in the first round. That said, you need to get an impact player. You need someone who's going to make an impact right away. You could put him on an NFL field, field tomorrow, and he might be a top 10 running back in this league, and he can play three downs, and you can put him at wide out if you need. Uh, I put him 10 to the Eagles and the Eagles have not drafted a running back in the first round since 1987 when they took Keith Byers out of Ohio State. It's not what they do. Howie Roseman does not do it. And they for years have not gone that route. And yet, if you're the Eagles and you've got this loaded roster and you just gave Jalen Hurts that money. I don't know. Maybe you zag this year and you say, let's get one more great playmaker and get over the hump. You know, I, I put him to, to the Eagles as well. Let's go. And I thought about the same things that you said. I'm like, the Eagles don't do this. Why are they the best team in the NFC right now? Because they've remained disciplined in, in the draft, right, Shrakes? Like, they've gone yeah. at the line of scrimmage. They get tougher on the defensive line and the offensive line. It's one of the big reasons why they're they're at the spot that they're at. And yet, you give this contract to your quarterback, and what do you need to do? You need to take hits off of him. And, and the way you take hits off of him is that you get him a threat that can help him both running the ball and in the short passing game. And so that's why, like, t- to me, the Eagles... They have the best roster in football, and they have the exact same question to ask themselves as the, and this is going to be exactly where we're going next. We're going to go move from players to teams here. Yeah. The Eagles, the Bills, the Bengals, maybe the Jags are in this as well. Maybe the how Chargers are in the hump? How do you beat Patrick Mahomes? Yep. You have to make a decision. This is what I said on my last episode. Shrakes, I said, you have to make a decision. Are you defending him or are you going to outscore him? And and we're going to see a lot of what that decision is for these organizations based on how they draft. So then, uh, now I'll ask you, let's go to the back end of the first round. Yeah. Let's go, you know, let, well, let's go Eagles at 10. Let's say Chargers 21, Jags 24. You've got Bills at 27, Bengals 28, Eagles again at 30. These seem like some luxury picks, right? And there's going to be some offensive players. I know that there's not blue chip guys at the end of the first round. I understand that. But you're going to have guys like, here's some names I'll throw out. I'd love your, your thoughts on these. Dalton Kincaid, tight end mm-hmm. from Utah. Jameer Gibbs, 
the running back from, from Alabama. Maybe a Zay Flowers, a wide receiver from Boston College. Maybe a Jordan Addison is available at that point. Maybe a Jalen Hyatt is available at that point. Maybe a Darnell Washington, the tight end from Georgia. Are these teams going to want to try to get offensive threats? Or are they going to go with a deep corner class? And are we going to be hearing guys like Deontay Banks, the corner from Maryland? Yeah, I think it's yeah those two positions, corners and wideouts and tight ends, and then you could just say get the best pass rusher. To your point earlier, like Miles Murphy sitting there at the end of the first round, like all right, let's just get the best pass rusher, add him to the rotation that we already have, and let's try to just get to Mahomes and let's try to disrupt Mahomes. And you know, the few teams that have had success against Mahomes are the ones who have been in his face and have been able to get to him. Um, you mentioned all those names. I've heard Kincaid can go as high as the top ten, you know, because might be the number one tight end in this draft in the last few drafts. And that going back to Kyle Pitts, he could be the best tight end to enter the league since then. Uh, Addison is a first round pick. Say Flowers is likely a first round pick. I haven't heard Jalen Hyatt is a first round pick as much as I've heard Quentin Johnson uh, at a TCU. I'm sure you've covered a bunch of his games hearing his name as a first round pick. And of course, Ohio State, uh, Jackson Smith, Njigba. I can't the name wrong. Yeah, there you Njigba. go. <laughs> I'm just praying I don't have to be the one to like react to his pick name because I will botch his name on national TV. It, it literally, um, Shriggs, let me help you. And this is how I always explained. I know it's literally exactly how it's spelled. You pronounce the N and then just say Jigba. In, in Jigba. Jigba. That's all right. I've already been crushed by fans for three weeks. No, now. not Ohio State, State fans. fans. They're, no, they're, they're very reasonable. Um, but those teams at the end of the first round are interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Buffalo Bills, do they add another wide receiver or do they say, let's go get the defensive end and try to keep on adding to what we've already got? And then, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals, their offensive line, do they add it? Here's the thing. This year's draft, and it's a cop out, I know, for someone who takes pride in being so accurate. I'll get 28 of the 32 or I'll get 27 of the 32 first round names right matching them to the team is really hard because of such flux up top. There's a guy who plays in the big 10. I'm going to ask you right now that I had eight to Atlanta, like around the combine in my own head. And now I'm hearing go 24 to Jacksonville. I don't know. What, to, what do you do with Lucas Van Ness who never started a football game at Iowa yeah. and is an absolute freak. And I've heard could go top 10. Like, what do you do with him? I don't know. So that that's a, that's a great question. Okay. So Lucas Van Ness, gets I don't want to say stuck cuz stuck's the wrong word at Iowa, right? He's he's a big play, but you have to understand this this is a guy that didn't play a ton of football early in his life and then all of a sudden he he gets to a point where he's at Iowa and he's in a system. They don't feature players as much as they feature the structure of their own defense at Iowa. And by the way, Iowa's defense has been quietly nobody talks about Very this. Very good. Easily the second best defense in all of college football over the and last two years. And it turns out NFL talent every year. That's exactly right. And and these guys know how to play in the league. So they're they're a very basic structure on first and second down. Four three cover four quarters. They create a lot of interceptions and takeaways, and they rely on their guys to create pressure on third down. Phil Parker, the defensive coordinator, gets much more creative. What ends up happening is is they believe in, in hierarchy of leadership there. And what can happen is that you get guys that have played a lot of football that just are the starters, and they roll out there. But Van Ness played more snaps than any of the defensive ends. He's the one that they would talk about. They would say, like, we need to keep him as fresh as possible for the moments when we need to get to the quarterback. He's our impact player. So... They viewed him as their best defensive player, and yet he didn't, quote, start a game. So I think you've got to do the background and, and know what the system is, know what the structure is at a place like Iowa, and realize that that's not the same as what happened with the Georgia pass rusher uh, a year ago well, that, yeah. you know, that wasn't on the field, uh, Travon yeah. uh, Walker. Travon Walker, yep. And, and that's a, a little bit different deal. Like in, in Georgia, they're going to roll out the best guys. Having having said that, I think Van Ness is is a really interesting pick because I said of what I said at the beginning, which is he hasn't played a ton of football yet, and so there's a big upside. So those teams in the top ten would be looking at Van Ness and they'd be thinking to themselves, we're 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 betting on a stock that's really low that has a huge upside in the future. I could see him go top ten. I've got him. I thought that the middle of this first round is going to get wonky. I don't love the Bucks spot at nineteen. No. Like the players that are going to be available, as you know, if you've probably heard this as well, 
there's probably 15 or 16 guys with legitimate first round grades yep. in this draft. Okay. That means when you get to 18, 19, 20, 21 in this draft, take the guy you like. You take the guy you like or you try to trade out. I think the Bucks are going to be dying to trade out to try to get more assets in what has become now a rebuild in the post Brady era. Yep. So I had them trading out of 19 so that the Ravens can jump up and start beating the dominoes of, of edge rushers. I think that they would love Nolan Smith, a guy that kind of fits that Baltimore style defense. Everybody loves Nolan Smith, right? His leadership, his intangibles. I'm sure you've heard his name quite often. And then I had the Bucks taking Van Ness at like 22. Okay, fine. But I don't know. Like, like yeah. I said, I know the names, but man, when you start placing them with teams, it's like, pff, I, I don't know Same. where they're going to go. Same. 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 Last, uh, not last thing. I, I, I've got a couple of other topics and and one is is these edge rushers and we talk with van about van s right now let me get your thoughts on tyree wilson uh because he's another guy that has a huge upside and and shregs i've i've heard houston at two kind of a high low but but tyree wilson what are you hearing about him and and what do you think his ceiling is he has a foot injury so he couldn't perform at the combine or to a pro day when the hope was he would, um, he's been medically cleared for that foot injury, which is a good sign. Uh, there is no physical specimen in this draft like Tyree Wilson. He was on Good Morning Football and NFL Network in studio with us. And we had Will Anderson. We've had every big name star. The, this man's body is built in a different way than these other guys. And when I say that, I'm talking about an 86 inch long wingspan. I'm talking about six, seven. 270 and yeah. can run a four four forty if he was healthy. Um, he's an absolute freak. And he actually put up numbers at Texas Tech. The injury kind of hampers him there at the end there, but he put up numbers at Texas Tech, good enough for a team that is not known for their defense. Can imagine Joel Clatt and Gus Johnson being assigned many Texas Tech games over the last We did. Few years. We had him against TCU this did you? last year. All right, yes. So you got him once. Well, and, uh, and by the way. I, he was the one I was most interested in. I wanted to go down, so I went down before the game, and I wanted to see Quentin Johnston up close and personal, yep. the wide receiver from TCU, and I wanted to see Tyree Wilson, along with a guy that Kendry Miller. He might be like a middle round, late round running back for TCU, but I wanted to see Tyree Wilson, and and I had the same reaction you did talking about him coming in the studio. I walked down there and I was like, oh, that's exactly what it's supposed to look like. Yeah, you know, no, it's like a dream, and and so. Yeah. I will He's say so this. long. I'm talking this like his arms. And this is not, again, I see all the NFL players. Like I, I have seen them in their most vulnerable settings. I've seen them in their most, you know, Super Bowl victory settings. There are no people in the league. I could think of that are built like this person. And yeah. it's yes, he's, he's strong, but just so long. He's all arms and legs and he's not a skinny string bean. He's yeah. a huge, huge dude. So if he's fast and he's got it and he's a good kid, which he is, um, I, I, I wouldn't like, you know, people last year were freaked out when Trayvon Walker went before Aiden Hutchinson and I get it. This one is not that with Will Anderson. Will Anderson was in studio also great talent, going to be solid. You know, he was 250 pounds and he looks the part and the whole thing. This guy looked different. Uh, I, I think he could have a big, by the way, if he was healthy for the combine, he would be the guy everyone's talking about because you're be right. He no would have, he would have blown the combine out of out of the water. All right, uh, Shregs, you've got um, a podcast as well. Why don't you tell everyone where they can find that? Yeah, it's with iHeartRadio. It's called The Season with Peter Schrager. Joel, I got to get you on this week. We're going to try to make that happen. Um, I also host the Good Morning Football Show every morning, seven to ten Eastern on NFL Network, and then. My home, my place, my my sacred, sacred place, Fox Sports. <laughs> you can find me on Sundays on That's Fox right. NFL kickoff. And you can see me on the field after the Super Bowl interviewing Paul Rudd uh, after his Kansas City Chiefs win the game. That's anyway. right. That's right. You got Paul again. Uh, you <laughs> found him and you guys had, you guys <laughs> had a moment again. Uh, it's can't it's wait to a... see you in Kansas City this week, brother. Let's go, bro. Thank you. Uh, you bet. I appreciate you coming on the show. That'll do it for this episode. Thanks for listening, everybody. Go follow us at Joel Klatt Show on all the social medias, and we'll be with you with a draft uh, draft recap uh, next week on Monday.